Kings 14. Uh, there's Bibles uh, here free to use if you want to uh, borrow one or keep one. Um, there's a guy in the back there. You could just raise your hand and get his uh, attention, uh, and he will get you a Bible to use. We're at uh, 1 Kings 14. We've just been working our way through this uh, Old Testament book of the Kings. And today we're going to uh, see that uh, um, th things are not always as they seem. <laughs> and we, 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 we experience that, that things are not always as they seem. Uh, I saw, uh, I read on the, the internet the other day that a local guy got burned at a landfill uh, at the landfill for because he was smoking in the bathroom and you know they have a lot of methane gas at the landfill and so there's signs everywhere saying do not smoke um, and they have those signs there because you can't see it <laughs> but this for some reason this guy thought it was a good idea to have a smoke in the bathroom and boom you know and and uh, you know even though it sounds kind of funny, it's really not because the guy got burned, you know, and uh, he learned that you got to be careful about paying attention to the rules because <laughs> things may not be as they seem. We've been watching, I don't know if you pay attention to this or not, but the, uh, the, uh, the stock market has been just nosediving since the last couple of weeks, the start of this year. You know, something like last I saw was like 1,700 points that it's dropped and and some would say that our whole financial situation in this country is not what it seems, that it's really kind of propped up and, and it's, it's not real, you know? And so that's why it has these gigantic fluctuations and, and so forth. And then of course, we know that people are not always what they seem either. You know, I, <laughs> Facebook reveals that to us sometimes, doesn't it? You know, maybe you know, have a friend or something whose life is a disaster, but on Facebook they project everything is all rosy, you know, and, and you look at that, you're like, well, their life isn't really like that, but folks want you to see an ideal life and, 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 and whatnot. And so we can, those things can happen in, our, in the world and we can become kind of jaded with it and not sure what to believe. But here's the thing, God wants his people to be sincere that we would represent the Lord by being real. And that's what I called this. I think that this is the point here for us today in the church to be real. Because we're gonna see two kings here in just a moment um, Then neither of them are what they seem to be on the outward, Jeroboam and Rehoboam. <laughs> but the Lord's gonna show us what they really are and the things that we should avoid uh, knowing these things about them. And these are for like if somebody is really hiding things in their life. You know, if there's someone that's listening to this message or here today that's just really in rebellion against God and hiding things and, and think they're getting away with it uh, from God and they're really not and he wants us to know that. Or maybe you are uh, someone who you really love the Lord but yet sometimes your outward persona and what you really are don't really line up that well. And so this chapter here speaks to that issue and the importance that we would be real and be on the alert that things aren't always as they seem. So we're going to begin here with part one with Jeroboam. And then we'll look at part two uh, later on here. Um, part one, Jeroboam, beginning in verse one. And I'll just read that one verse. It says, and at that time, Abijah, the son of Jeroboam, became sick. So we're jumping in the middle of a, of a, of a story. It's all one you know, story here in uh, 1 Kings. But this is after Solomon. King Solomon, is, he, he has died. But at the end of King Solomon's reign as king, he fell into sin. And we covered that previously in 1 Kings. But because he did that, he caused the kingdom of Israel to be divided into two, the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. It used to be united under David and then Solomon, but he blew it. 
and now it's two kingdoms instead of one. Jeroboam, there in verse 1, he, he was one of uh, Solomon's chief servants, and he became the king over northern Israel. God made him the king over northern Israel. But unfortunately, he didn't learn his lesson, learn a lesson from, uh, from watching Solomon, and he just kept doing what Solomon was doing. He led Israel into sin. And the way he did it was by making false altars to God, for false gods, doing all sorts of evil things. And as a matter of fact, if you back up a couple verses into chapter 13, verse 33, it tells us that he did whatever he wanted to do. Even though God told him, this is how you lead your people. You obey me. You walk in truth. You, you trust me. He didn't do any of that. He did what he wanted to do. He didn't obey God. And so instead, what we saw last time is he created his own religion, really. He had his own priests. He had his own feast days. He had his own sacrificial system. He just totally uh, uh, disregarded the way God said and made it uh, his own, even though it was sort of a, a mimic of what uh, God had said. And so now we see his son here, Abijah. Now that son is probably the rightful heir to the throne of Jeroboam, but as we see there, he's, he's deathly ill. That's what it means. And we don't know how old this guy is, and he's probably really little. And, uh, and so it's a concern for that family, as it would be any family. So what happens? Let's look at verse 2 and 3 together. It says, And Jeroboam said to his wife, Please arise and disguise yourself, that they may not recognize you as the wife of Jeroboam, and go to Shiloh. Indeed, Ahijah, the prophet, is there, who told me that I would be king over this people. Also take with you ten loaves, some cakes, and a jar of honey, and go to him. He will tell you what will become of the child. Okay, don't get confused here. <laughs> We've got a lot of things that sound alike. There's Jeroboam and Rehoboam, and there's also Abijah and Ahijah. <laughs> Keep it all straight. Abijah is the son. Ahijah is the prophet, okay? So Jeroboam, who's the subject here in part one, he's the king of the northern tribe of Israel. He's wanting to know what's going to happen to his son. And so he tells his wife <laughs> to disguise herself. Which is, uh, you know, she, she looks like a queen typically, so it's probably like to put on sort of a peasant gown or whatever. What a chicken to send your wife to do this, right? And he says, go down to the city of Shiloh and, and where this prophet Ahijah was, was living and, and take a bribe with you, you know, so we can find out what's wrong uh, with him. Now I want you to notice something here. <laughs> he doesn't ask one of his false gods that he was worshiping, does he? Of course not. If your God is a little idol that you created out of wood, which is what they did, it would be ridiculous to ask that thing for help when your child is sick, right? If your child has a deathly thing going on with them, it would be ridiculous to ask that little idol that you made for help. So then my question is, why worship it in the first place? Hello? <laughs> Gotta th think this through. But he, he, he wants his wife to go to Ahijah because he knows Ahijah is of the Lord. If, if you remember back in chapter 11, Ahijah told Jeroboam the future. And, and the future came true. <laughs> And so Jeroboam knows who God is speaking through, and he knows where to go to get help now. And think about this. I mean, you guys are like that, that when you share the hope of God with people who don't know him, when tragedy uh, of life comes around, and it always does, they will know where to go for comfort and hope because you, you explained it to them. You know, people show up here that had us share the Lord with them or, 
or give them some hope or, or, or saw something once and then when something bad happened, they showed up because they knew where to go to get love like that and to find out more about God's grace and be comforted. So Jeroboam sends his wife. <laughs> but why wear the disguise? Why disguise her? Well, I think it's because he knows that the whole thing is a sham. But he doesn't want everybody else to know it. It's like I mentioned before, everything is not always as it seems. <laughs> and he doesn't want everybody else to know that the leader of the religion doesn't believe in it. As I'm sure that happens today with leaders of false religions and cults do things to hide it because they know it's not even true. It's just this thing they've propped up and they don't want all the followers to see through the, the problem uh, with it. You know, he didn't want people to know that he was in real trouble and needed a real God. <laughs> and again, people do this often. Uh, someone who might say, well, I'm an agnostic or I'm an atheist. They say these things until things get really, really bad. And then they sneak off and ask a Christian coworker to pray for him. And you know how I know that they do that? Because they've done it to me. <laughs> and... It's not that I, I'm glad they come to me. I'm glad they come to you, believers, when disaster strikes. I mean, we don't hold it against them. That's, there's got to be a place to go for hope. It's just that this is sort of that thing that doesn't, it isn't up here as what it really is. And so here's Jeroboam sending his wife to, to sneak off to find out what's going to happen to her son. Well, what happens with it. Well, let's look at verse 4 through 6. It says, And Jeroboam's wife did so. She arose and went to Shiloh and came to the house of Ahijah. But Ahijah could not see, for his eyes were glazed by reason of his age. Now the Lord had said to Ahijah, Here is the wife of Jeroboam coming to ask you something about her son, for he is sick. Thus and thus you shall say to her, for it will be when she comes in that she will pretend to be another woman. And so it was when Ahijah heard the sound of her footsteps as she came through the door, he said, Come in, wife of Jeroboam. Why do you pretend to be another person? For I have been sent to you with bad news. Isn't that awesome? Wouldn't you love to have that gift to be able to do that? If you have kids, you know, come here, son. Oh, and when are you going to tell me about that window you broke earlier today? <laughs> you know, kind of thing. So the Lord spoke to him in advance and said, Heads up, Mrs. J is going to show up here and she's going to try to fool you. Now, Ahijah, as we saw there, he's, he's an old man at this time and, and he was blind. It looks like that he has some sort of cataracts or something like that. So he couldn't see, but he could, he could hear just fine. As I read through this, I, there's a couple things here that are really funny to me. The first one is I think it's kind of funny that she disguised herself and he's blind. <laughs> Right, kind of ironic. Or, here's another one, Jeroboam thought Ahijah could tell the future but not know she was disguised. <laughs> I mean, there's, he's just not thinking things through here. He, he thinks, like lots of people think, that they can hide things from God and nothing is hidden from God. <laughs> We might be able to fool another person, but the Lord is never fooled. And, you know, this is both an encouragement and a, and a conviction for us believers. Because, you know, it's, it's not easy when we have an old nature that's still hanging around to, to always be aligned, you know, the outward with the inward. Because we are brought up to project something that's different 
than what we really are inside. I mean, the whole fallen man is phony. <laughs> and, uh, you know, we're just liars from the beginning. And that's one of the things that the Lord began to change in me right away when I got saved, um, you know, 20 some years ago, was that now you don't have to be, live a lie anymore. I mean, all I did when I was in my 20s and before that was just, I was just a liar all the time. What I projected and what I really was, was totally different. And so then we get a new nature, we come into the family of Christ and <laughs> It's like the Lord saying, why are you pretending to be another person still? You know, just be who you are in the Lord. And so this really urges me as a Christian, and I hope it does you too, to walk in truth. Just walk in truth. Walk in the fear of the Lord. Because he already knows what you're doing and what you're thinking. Anyway. <laughs> And so we might as well just walk in truth. You know, sincerity, you guys, is a godly attribute. These guys, Mr. and Mrs. J, they don't, they don't have it. They don't have any sincerity, but you can. I love how Paul the Apostle, he was talking to a church that he planted in Corinth, and uh, he was talking to him about this subject, and he said, our, our boasting is in the testimony of our conscience that we would conduct ourselves in this world in simplicity and in sincerity, godly in sincerity, not with the fleshly way of the world, but in the abundance of God towards my brothers and sisters and the non-believers in the world, that sincerity. You see, the Bible urges you and I to act and speak with sincerity of heart. And I think that that's why there in verse 6 he asks the question, why do you pretend to be another person? I pray that none of us are pretending to be something that we're not. If you're pretending to be something that you're not, then, then that's an a, a inward person problem that needs to be reconciled with God. It seems like our world, that's all it does, is try to project something that they're not. But the solution is a closer walk with Jesus. The closer, I believe, the closer that you walk with Jesus, the more those two things will line up. Who you project you are and who you really are. And don't we want those two things to be the same? Okay, well, he had said, the prophet, that he had some bad news for her. So what was the bad news that he had? Well, let's read verses 7 through 11. It says, he said, Go, tell Jeroboam, thus says the Lord God of Israel, because I exalted you from among the people and made you ruler over my people Israel and tore the kingdom away from the house of David and gave it to you, and yet you have not been as my servant David who kept my commandments and who followed me with all his heart, to do only what was right in my eyes, but you have done more evil than all who were before you. For you have gone and made for yourself and other, uh, other gods and, and molded images to provoke me to anger and have cast me behind your back. Therefore, behold, I will bring disaster on the house of Jeroboam and will cut off from Jeroboam every male in Israel, bond and free, I will take away the remnant of the house of Jeroboam as one takes away refuge until it is all gone. The dogs shall eat whoever belongs to Jeroboam and dies in the city, and the birds of the air shall eat whoever dies in the field, for the Lord has spoken. Whoa. Whoa. He says, all your male descendants are going to die, are going to die terrible deaths and you know what all you have to do is read the next chapter because all this takes place just like he says it's less than two years later all this occurs now I want to point out something here <laughs> this this isn't happening or it's, it doesn't happen because God is vindictive this will happen as a result 
of his own sin. <laughs> sin is a reward of its own. You know, the Bible tells us that it, it leads to death. And that's why we're urged not to partake in it <laughs> because it just, it, it's death. And eventually that's where it will go, destruction. And you know, God can certainly intervene and cause these kinds of hardships. <laughs> but most of the time, people cause their own disasters due to sin. And that's a warning for us um, from looking at Jeroboam here because he causes his own disaster. Now, the prophet isn't done because he gives us bad news about the son, which is why she came there, right? Look at verses 12 and 13. It says, arise therefore, go to your own house. When your feet enter the city, the child shall die and all Israel shall mourn for him and bury him. For he is the only one of Jeroboam who shall come to the grave because in him there is found something good toward the Lord God of Israel in the house of Jeroboam. This chapter is difficult because uh, even though there's things happening here that are not good, God is good. And he's demonstrating his grace here that is shown through all the mess, just like he does in, in our world, you know? You see the grace of God, it, it, despite the disaster that human beings create for themselves. Here's this son who won't live, he just said. But to God, it's a gracious thing to take him away from this. You know, the boy was probably sick with some kind of fatal illness, but rather than heal him, which God could certainly do, he raises people from the dead. People who can't walk, he makes them leap on the temple steps. So God can heal people. But for some reason, he's elected to take him away instead. Now, I wanted to point out here is kind of the underlying tone of this chapter, as I've been saying that um, things are not as always as they seem. Um, this is not what it seems on the surface either. Because we, don't we tend to believe that death is the worst thing that can happen? And for good reason. Because God put in all of us, humans, <laughs> the drive to stay alive. <laughs> Didn't he? You know, you have in you a natural desire to keep living. <laughs> you know, that's why people when they get really, really sick with something, they will do almost anything to stay alive. They'll try anything, right? Because we have a natural instinct to live. We keep feeding ourselves. We keep breathing air. We keep, you know, we get out of the way of the bus coming down the street. And, you know, all those, we have a drive to stay alive. We want to live. And because of that drive, some of us think, we, we typically do, that death is always bad. But for Christians, we know that death is actually an upgrade, a big promotion. Uh, I was uh, at the hospital yesterday uh, visiting with a sister in our church, Tony, who's in her last days. Uh, her husband's here today. You could pray for him and, and for her. You know, I just went there to pray with her and comfort her. But she loves Jesus and uh, her hope is in the upgrade <laughs> because there's really nothing. They've tried pretty much everything and there's nothing that they can do, you know? And so her focus is on glorification, <laughs> to see Jesus face to face. And that's what all of us Christians hope for. If we just hope in this world, Paul said, we're, we're pitiable people. <laughs> Our hope is in the resurrection, the glorification of the saints and, and where he said to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. You see, it's better <laughs> to be with the Lord. I know a pastor who, uh, when he, he presides over funerals for Christians, he calls them coronation services. <laughs> that doesn't sound like a bummer, does it? <laughs> it's great. You know, James said that when uh, believers die, that uh, those of us who love God are given the crown of life. 
It's going to be awesome. <laughs> and we will enter glory. But it's hard to reconcile, we, to reconcile the two because we have this drive to stay alive. And, and I know we love life, you know, and we're supposed to do the best we can with this life. And, but sometimes it seems, like in our verses here, that God sometimes, in his mercy, will remove someone for their own good. You know, we're going to get to Elijah here in a couple of, of chapters, and, and God takes him out at the height of his ministry. And this little boy here was taken away. Look back at verse 13. It says he was taken away because God found something good in him towards God. That's why. If you have an NIV Bible, uh, it says that he was the only one in the house of Jeroboam that the Lord found anything good. Uh, if you have the ESV translation, it says, in him there was found something pleasing to the Lord. <laughs> you see, because of God's foreknowledge, because he is omniscient, he knows everything, he, including the future, he knew Abijah, this boy's heart, was going to be towards him. And so God apparently wants to spare him the suffering of living amongst the reign of Jeroboam and everything that's going on in, in northern Israel. And so he chose to remove him. And you know, maybe this can comfort someone. You, maybe you know somebody who's lost a child. And know that maybe it was God keeping them away from a, a hardship life of pain and suffering or something. And, and God in his mercy sometimes will call a child home to him instead of what's going on uh, around them or what will happen to them. It's the only way we can really reconcile this, and, and God is gracious. Well, it says in verse 14, it says, Moreover, the Lord will raise up for himself a king over Israel who shall cut off the house of Jeroboam. This is the day. What? Even now. <laughs> For the Lord will strike Israel as a reed is shaken in the water. He will uproot Israel from this good land which he gave to their fathers and will scatter them beyond the river because they have made their wooden images provoking the Lord to anger. And he will give Israel up because of the sins of Jeroboam who sinned and who made Israel sin. Jeroboam is in big trouble, right? <laughs> And it's because not only was he a sinner himself, but because he made others do it too. You know, God holds, holds people accountable. He holds them accountable. All these things are judged by God because he's just. Well, then Jeroboam's wife, verse 17, arose and departed and came to Terzah. And when she came to the threshold of the house, the child died. And they buried him, and all Israel mourned for him, according to the word of the Lord, which he spoke through his servant, Ahijah, the prophet. I feel bad for the wife in this chapter. You know, she seems to be sort of a pawn or a victim herself of Jeroboam. Can you imagine what it would be like it was about 20 miles that she had to walk back. Imagine her trudging home after getting all this news, knowing what was going to happen and the pain that she must be going through because of it. And here's the, the bottom line with it. All of this is unnecessary. <laughs> all of it. They did this to themselves. And God's just telling them what's going to happen because of it. Well, now the rest of the acts of Jeroboam, how he made war and how he reigned, indeed, they are written in the book of the chronicles of the kings of Israel. The, this period, uh, the period that Jeroboam reigned was 22 years. So he rested with his fathers. Then Nadab, his son, reigned in his place. When the writer in 1 Kings mentions the chronicles of the kings, uh, it's, it's speaking about the official records that the kingdom would keep to, you know, the events that would happen. It's not speaking of the Bible. Even though you can read 
about some of these things that he's talking about. For example, if you were to go to look over in 2 Chronicles 13, it gives a summary of some of those things that he just, he just said. But um, that's not what this means. It's talking about the records that the, that the, that the kings uh, kept of all the stuff that they were doing. But I want to point out <laughs> that those king's records are not what they seem either. <laughs> You know, they would, they would, I'm sure, talk about all the great things that they did in the kingdom and, and all the conquests and, and so forth. But they don't tell the whole story. I'm sure it doesn't tell the story of how he destroyed the nation through sin. I won't say anything about that. But God does. Because <laughs> God reveals to us the whole truth. <laughs> Now his son is going to take over in chapter 15, uh, but he isn't any better than his dad. The apple doesn't fall far from the Jeroboam tree. He's basically the same. As a matter of fact, all of the kings of the northern kingdom of Israel are bad. There's 19 of them, one after another after another, and they're all bad. Some are worse than others, but all of them rebel against God. And it ends up well, spoiler alert, if you don't want to know this, uh, cover your ears, <laughs> but I'm just going to tell you, spoiler alert, it ends up with Assyria conquering northern Israel. And it's because they did it to themselves. They invited sin in, and, and the Lord had this other nation come in and just run them out of there. Now, why does God show us all this? This may not be the, the subject that you were hoping to hear about this morning, you know, evil and hopelessness and, and all that kind of stuff. Why do we see so much of this in the Bible, especially with Israel and, and this time with the kings? Well, to me, basically the lesson for us is, is that man is incapable of ruling and reigning over man. <laughs> and God shows us that repeatedly. You know, that all governments actually fail in that respect. The history of the kings just shows us in a few chapter how there's just this gradual deterioration to just where it's total corruption. And isn't that what we're kind of seeing a picture of in our own country to a certain degree, you know? Here we have our government that's probably the best that the world has ever seen. Most people would agree with that. But it has great weaknesses, doesn't it? You know, there's greed and corruption. And you know why? Because men and women run it. <laughs> Fallen people. And so God shows us these things to remind us that we only have one hope. And it's not in who the next president is. <laughs> Our hope is in Jesus Christ. And the only way that things will ultimately be absolutely fair and peaceful is when Jesus rules and reigns. Right? He will for a thousand years on this earth, and it will be peace here. So the exhortation here, before we go on, is don't put your trust in man or women. Put your trust in the Lord. That's where they messed up. They didn't. So that's part one with our with our friend Jeroboam, and uh, he uh, uh, wasn't what he seems. Now, um, Rehoboam, uh, beginning here, part two, and this one will go faster than the first part. Uh, Rehoboam is no relation to Jeroboam, hard to believe, um, except that he's not what he seems either. So these two go together in that, and we'll, we'll look at that. So I'm going to begin verse 21 to 24. It says, in Rehoboam, the son of Solomon, reigned in Judah. Rehoboam was 41 years old when he became king. He reigned 17 years in Jerusalem, the city which the Lord had chosen out of all the tribes of Israel to put his name there. His mother's name was Naama and Ammonitus. Now Judah did evil in the sight of the Lord, and they provoked him to jealousy with their sins, which they committed more than all that their fathers had done. For they also built for themselves high places, sacred pillars, and wooden images on every high hill and under, under every green tree. And there were also perverted persons in the land. They did according to all the abominations of the nations which the Lord had cast out before the children of Israel. 
So it's speaking of the problem of the high places. And high places were, is where sin would just run rampant. It would be like if we were to build a city, say, oh, I don't know, out in the desert somewhere, where secret things were done. Maybe there was lots of sexual immorality out there and, and lots of drinking and, and they would make it appear like it was a good thing. You could even bring your kids to it and they would find things for them to do there. But you could go and watch a cheesy Elvis impersonator while they take all your money from you, you know? You ever heard of a place like that? You know, we set up our shrines here too. <laughs> It doesn't have to be just like that. Rehoboam set up his shrines. And oftentimes the way that it's done is it, it appears like it's something good. You know? But things are not always what they seem. For the Israelites, it was a way to give honor to false gods. And when they do, they invite all sorts of abominations into their culture perverted things it said there in verse 24 and what what happens how what does that do to God does it say in verse 24 it provoked him to what jealousy do you see that God is jealous for the well-being of his people <laughs> you know Israel in the Old Testament is referred to as the wife of God and so when they fall into adultery by falling in love with false gods, he is jealous for them because he loves them. Even though they're unfaithful to him, he loves them. And he doesn't want them to do that. And so this is the result of what they're doing. And so as it happened in, in the fifth year of King Rehoboam, verse 25, that, that Shishak, king of Egypt, came up against Jerusalem. And he took away the treasures of the house of the Lord and the treasures of the king's house. He took away everything. He also took away all the gold shields which Solomon had made. The writer is assuming that you've been reading the whole book, First Kings. And know that back in chapter 10, that Solomon had all those gold shields made. Remember that? Spend a lot of money on it. And as a matter of fact, almost everything in the temple was gold. And now, what we're being shown is it's all gone. It's, it only took five years. And it's all, all that trouble, all that work, all that expense, all that glory, it's gone. And it's because Shishak, this king, he realized when Solomon died that there was a weakening of Israel. And so he took advantage of it to raid the gold. The enemy will take advantage of uh, when the believers are not paying attention to what they're doing. Because Egypt is a picture of the world in the Bible. The flesh, the strength of man. And, you know, here's Israel saved out of e Egypt, the captivity of it all. In the Old Testament, God sends Moses to liberate them from it. And now they're going back under the control of it. It's ironic, if you go back to the beginning of 1 Kings, Solomon married uh, uh, a king of Egypt's daughter to protect Israel, but they ended up taking all of his stuff from his son anyway. If we disobey God and take shortcuts to get ahead, it does not work. We're supposed to obey the Lord. Now, you know what's really cool is 2 Chronicles 12 gives much more detail than we have here on what happened to Rehoboam. It tells us that when all this started to go down, that all the leaders there in Rehoboam, they repented. They said, the Lord is righteous. We blew it. Help us. And because of that, he doesn't have Shishak destroy Judah like the northern kingdom is destroyed. As a matter of fact, he says this, when he humbled himself, the wrath of God turned from him so as not to destroy him completely, and things also went well in Judah. <laughs> you see, we come back to the fact that God wants his people just to be real. That my outward would be the same as my inward. That we would be projecting sincerity to God and to other people. 
Because once Rehoboam stopped being a phony towards God, the destruction ceased in his life. And what a great lesson uh, for us. Well, it says, then King Rehoboam, verse 27, made bronze shields in their place and committed them to the hands of the captains of the guard who guarded the doorway of the king's house. And whenever the king entered the house of the Lord, the guards carried them, then brought them back into the guard room. <laughs> you know, this is shown to us here because the kingdom is no longer what it was. Remember, it was gold before, and now it's bronze, lesser. Every time this would happen, he would be reminded of what it once was. And you know, I feel bad because Christians have this happen to them sometimes. You know, Christians who stray from God have this experience and, and there's destruction around them even though the Lord loves them. There's, they often experience uh, uh, um, the riches in, of Christ in their life vanishing because they're like out of fellowship with him. You know, something that was great, a f their, their sweet family that they had. And maybe they fell into sin and then they lost their family. And then the rest of their days, they're reminded with those brash shields <laughs> that that's what I had. And I just totally disobeyed God. People try to maintain the appearance that they're who they were. You know. Somebody who's out of fellowship with the Lord, maybe they still post Bible verses on Instagram. Say, see my brass shield here? You know, but it's not really what it's like with me right now and him. It's not what it seems. Paul said the way to stop this is to take the shield of faith. <laughs> Just take the shield of faith every day, hold it out in front of you, it'll quench the fiery darts. <laughs> and he's talking about just walking with Jesus every day in every way. And then none of this stuff is a concern to us. You know, maybe you're here today and the richness that you once had in the Lord is not what it is now. You might ask God to forgive you like they did. Just repent. If you confess your sins, he's faithful and just to forgive you and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. Well, let's finish. Verse 29. It says, Now the rest of the acts of Rehoboam and all that he did, are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the kings of Judah? And there was a war between Rehoboam and Jeroboam all their days. So Rehoboam rested with his fathers and was buried with his fathers in the city of David. His mother's name was Naamah, and Amadidas, and then Abijam, his son, reigned in his place. <laughs> so we're told there at the end they battled with each other all their days. You know, don't get confused. They were kings at the same time. One in the north, one in the south. And so they're battling, but both of them are wrong. <laughs> they're battling for the wrong things. It's not even right to begin with. It's, it's a tragedy, First Kings, because at the start of Solomon's reign, it was glorious. They were all about the Lord and everything. And now look at it. It's a disaster. And so we see this because this is not how the Lord wants people to live. If you're here today and you've had enough of it, praise the Lord. Go to, go to God and just tell him. Tell him. Everybody hopefully gets to a point where they say, enough, I'm sick of this. I don't want to live like this anymore. I want to walk with Jesus and he will take you because he loves you. And so I hope you see the importance of being real, to be sincere with God and each other, to be repentant, to have a fear of the Lord. Uh, let me just leave you with this. Um, be careful, you guys, of being a pretender. God busts me, uh, not busts me, because he loves me as a son. He more just like shows me my hypocrisy when I am not exactly outwardly what I am inwardly. And uh, he wants me to be sincere. He wants you to be sincere. So be careful of being a pretender. <laughs> well, let's pray.